Okay, very good morning to you. Before I begin, don't forget, as per usual, to subscribe to the YouTube channel. New content coming every day of the week for myself and the rest of the team. Um, I'm going to focus on, as per usual, the kind of macro top level fundamentals of what we're looking out for, not just today, but this week. But if you want the technical setup video as issued by Sam yesterday, you can find it on the channel by just finding his uh, category. So let's just have a look at the, the charts this morning and what have we got in store. So yeah, a little bit of risk off, I guess, in terms of the equity index futures seen negative at the moment does follow um, a little bit of a downside session seen in Asia, um, some significant individual single stock news seeing HSBC standard chartered shares in the Asia Pacific um, time zone coming under some pressure. So keeping an eye on them at the open of FTSE trade. Uh, I'll get into that in a little bit more detail shortly. Otherwise, in the FX market, the dollar was weaker overnight, um, albeit has just bumped up a little as Europe has come in. Uh, but that does see then euro dollar in slight positive territory. Uh, also, cable just sitting above its pivot in the futures. Uh, euro dollar, you can see here, just running into some resistance at around the highs that we're seeing towards the back end of last week, uh, also during the Asia Pacific session. Noting as well that Japan was out overnight. They're on market holiday, uh, not returning um, until Wednesday. So, elsewhere, fixed income, pretty quiet. Gold as well, relatively range bound. Uh, oil, a little bit negative, bit of a break of a trend line in the short term technicals this morning uh, on that $41 handle here just with those previous lows that were seen uh, at the opening of electronic trade, maybe just acting now as a little bit of resistance on that last run low we've had more recently, but moves relatively uh, contained at this point in time. Right, so let's get, let's get stuck into some headlines. Uh, quite a few things, starting off with HSBC shares uh, fall to a 25-year low. Uh, so why has this happened? Well, their shares were down in excess of 4% at one point. Standard charted down a similar margin uh, in their Hong Kong shares. Um, and they dropped after media reports that they and other banks move large sums of alleged illicit funds over nearly two decades. Um, in addition to this, HSBC is a possible candidate for China's quote, unreliable entity list that aims to punish firms, organizations, or individuals that damage national security, according to the uh, Global Times, which is the kind of state-run media newspaper in China, in the mainland. That came out over the weekend. Um, China have issued rules regarding its proposed unreliable entities list. While it reportedly did not have a timetable or preset names of companies, they warned that foreign firms, if they violate nation's laws or commit illegal acts, they could be included in this list and face measures. Now, although over the, uh, the overnight session, China have denied this, those media reports do hint that US firms are potential targets for that list could include the likes of Qualcomm, Cisco, Apple, and FedEx as well. So, um, worth keeping an eye on those guys at the market reopen a few hours time on the noisy. Uh, but yeah, HSBC getting pretty pounded overnight uh, does come after, you know, just in that that local region, uh, whether it be trade war, whether it be uh, the disruptions that have been seen in Hong Kong and the national security law or the ongoing uh, protesting that's been happening. You know, their shares now, I think they're down roughly 50% on the year. So incredibly difficult times there and not only those two banks but Deutsche Bank as well appears to have facilitated more than half of the leaked two trillion dollars of suspicious transactions that were flagged to the US government over nearly two decades is part of the same story uh, that was weighing on those other banks uh, and DB shares ahead of the cash equity open are called down around seven percent at the market open well look, let's get the latest uh, we're seeing down around 6.8% uh, at the moment. So that was some of the overnight stuff. Um, otherwise, elsewhere, a lot of the weekend press has been filled with COVID updates. Uh, I'm not sure if you were out and about over the weekend, but uh, again, managed to go for a bit of a walk on Sunday and it was super busy. Um, I did say this before, the, the lockdown uh, from the, the group gatherings from 30 to 6 and uh, I was commenting I remember this time last week about uh, I had a walk along South Bank and it was absolutely heaving uh, well this time I went to Battersea Park anyone familiar with London and I have never seen it that busy in my life uh, enough that I felt uncomfortable and, and, and wore my mask 
um, all day rather than just generally when, when it's necessary when going into shops. So yeah, I've said this last week and uh, I'll kind of repeat it. I think that, and it's already being seen, but I think it's going to get a lot worse. Um, just the general um, lack of, uh, I guess, adhering to just general sensibility of the realization that we are still in the middle of a pandemic just by the broad mass. I think that uh, these rates are going to get far worse uh, than what they are um, at the moment and hence the reason why I think you're starting to get a lot of these noises this morning. The government knows this is the case. Um, so what have, what have we got here? Well Britain is said to be at a critical point now uh, in the coronavirus pandemic. Boris Johnson is set to say today as concerns mount of a second lockdown that might be needed to stop the renewed spread of the disease. So daily cases now uh, as we were seeing towards the end of last week are at their highest level since May. Hospitalizations in England are doubling every eight days, and the R number, the reproductive rate uh, for the virus now stands at between 1.1 to 1.4 as of Friday. So anticipation is that that number will, will be rising. Uh, the warning comes as well amid expectations that local restrictions could be extended to London. Uh, Mayor Sadiq Khan was speaking in the Telegraph over the weekend will recommend tightened rules on the capital later today is the expectation. Uh, this will include then the potential for pushing people back to working from home if possible rather than going into the office. Uh, separately, one of the other things that's come out is Rishi Sunak has indicated further support is needed to prevent large scale business collapsing uh, plus job losses. He is preparing to extend four loan programs that have already issued some 53 billion pounds of credit for companies through state guarantees, according to the FT. Uh, it still isn't uh, thought to believe that Sunak will extend the furlough program, but he's preparing these other measures according to those close to the situation. Also as well, it was just last Tuesday, I think uh, the Chancellor gave a speech where he was saying that extending furlough is not the right situation. One of the things that they fear here is that they're basically propping up, I guess, what you could call zombie jobs that are only there because companies are getting backstopped by the government paying for a large proportion of people's salaries and that if that was to be removed, then they would just fire them anyway. So... Here, I guess what the approach would appear to be is that there's a wave of job losses set to come then at the expiration of furlough in, at the end of October. And so what he's looking to do then is provide extra credit facilities to uh, a number of, of, of companies so that they can still function and operate. Um, so, yeah, there's seemingly then something to, to keep an eye on, not just in the UK, but Europe as well. Mainland Europe is experiencing equal size rises at the moment in COVID-19 cases. Um, similar news, I guess, in regard to the virus, AstraZeneca stated its vaccine trial in the US still remains on hold. Uh, remember, that was thought to have come back in last Wednesday after we saw that previous weekend disruption um, due to the halt in that trial. Still don't think that that's a real major thing at this point. It's still relatively normal practice and procedure to see these types of halts uh, to investigate um, as per what happens that particular individual in question in the UK as response to those clinical trials but um, yeah the COVID situation is worsening uh, in important economic areas mainland Europe and the UK and depending on the severity of course of the types of um, rollback of them moving back in towards more tighter more stringent lockdown obviously it's going to have repercussions then on the economic recovery of these countries in question. Um, so yeah, this will be a, a recurring, a big theme, I'm sure, throughout the week. Um, sticking with the UK, one of the other things that a lot of people are looking at on the calendar this week uh, is this chap. This is the governor of the Bank of England, Andrew Bailey, of course, and he's going to be speaking uh, a couple times this week. Um, but before that, we did have the chief economist, he spoke at the weekend, uh, Andy Haldane, and he actually said that the UK is recovering faster than anyone expected. Um, yeah, probably a little bit ill-timed, just given the situation, what's going on with COVID, but that's beside the point that I think what Haldane is being used for here, which is a tactical approach by the Bank of England to manage and tame runaway expectations that the Bank of England will immediately adopt 
negative interest rates. Now, the way that financial markets tend to react is we over-interpret what central banks say. Uh, this is just general human psychology. We take one little morsel of information and we, we run with it. And obviously, after the kind of uh, the revealing of the progressive talks that they had been having with regulators about the mechanics of how the negative interest rates work, it's about as close as we've got without inactioning negative rates that we're definitely heading toward that direction potentially in the future. So for me, this is kind of uh, central banking 101 communication tactics. You send out arguably the most hawkish member uh, of your monetary policy committee, which is well known as Andy Haldane. He comes out, talks the other side of the book, just to make sure that um, investors are kept honest uh, and it doesn't get to a point where the Bank of England has to deliver that policy response. That's definitely what they don't want to do. They want to assure markets, but they don't want markets to be priced so certain for a, a rate cut into negative territory that they then have to deliver it at fear of disappointing markets and causing you know, a loss of confidence. So I think I wouldn't read too much and overinterpret Haldane's comments. Uh, and what can we expect from... Uh, Andrew Bailey, he's going to be speaking. He's giving two separate speeches on Tuesday and Thursday this week. Uh, I would expect him to not really give away too much. I would say that don't look for anything too explicit. The appropriate hints that he wanted to convey, I guess, from the Bank of England meeting have now been deployed. So I wouldn't be looking for too much additional guidance, but it will be something that will need to be watched quite closely and obviously would carry the propensity to move uh, the sterling currency quite sharply. Um, looking at the US, this is one of the other things um, that has come up as a bit of a talking point and probably will do so stateside uh, because you might not have heard of Ginsburg, uh, but the death of Supreme Court Associate uh, Justice Ginsburg has opened another front in the election battle with President Trump, intending to make a nomination in the week ahead. Um, so this is about then the potential to have a more, let's say, Trump um, conservative political alignment in terms of the positioning and nomination of the candidate he would want to put forward, which could then have a knock on repercussion of being more beneficial for him should, as we expect, then the mail in ballot uh, process of going into a uh, US election. The result is unlikely to be known for a number of weeks. There's probably lots going to be lots of legal action about contesting over certain um, results over certain states. And so having um, a Supreme Court associate justice in his favour is going to be much more beneficial for the prospect of him potentially winning the US election. So he's very much going to be on it and it's already been a dominant theme over the weekend. Uh, and one of the things that I think this could be then is, is it going to detract from what was looking like some slight progress in stimulus talks in America, where you had, you know, you've got this kind of ongoing debate and we've seen some movement, but the likes of Pelosi, for example, still standing pat at 2.2 trillion uh, and that being too much for what the Republicans want at this point in time. But are they going to be now distracted given the legal consequence and the repercussion this could have on the overall outcome of the election over this particular uh, vacancy now in this role. Um, to give you a bit of idea, uh, Lisa Murkowski and Susan Collins have come out against pre-election confirmation of a nominee and they are two Republican senators. Uh, opposition from two more GOP senators would put brakes on the process um, so just in terms of what to look out for and how to interpret the news, I'd be aware of that. Um, just having a quick look at the US equities uh, at the moment, I did see technically, I was looking at some daily charts this morning and we have got beneath what I thought was quite a key area, which is this trend line going back to April. We've had a, a test a couple times in May, in June, and then some of the recent price activity through the early part of SEP and a failed break on the 17th last Thursday. So. Uh, we've gapped below there and that does that trend line kind of map the 50 DMA very closely which would be a key level of near term uh, technical relevance. So here now uh, it does look quite interesting uh, from a potential uh, for a little bit of a short term push on the downside here 32.84 and a half would be that high point 
um, from the peak before the intensification of trade tensions with China. Anything below there on the week, if we did push lower down, 32.31 and a quarter would bring in that previous recovery high we had in mid-June. That was an area of resistance as well. You can see in mid-July as well uh, would be a target uh, and then down to 32.00 and 31.92 if that were to continue as a trend. Um, the Nasdaq similarly uh, has come to quite an interesting point on the chart from a daily continuation point of view. And I was looking here at really this uh, rectangle that I've colored, which was an area of previous resistance and support, which the market has respected really on a number of occasions through July, August and September. It's kind of been like this area of which the market either fails to get above or if it breaks, it really does start to move then uh, to the upside. Uh, and interestingly, we at the reopening of trade opened just below what had been a key area of support. You can see even more recently in the month of September on three previous occasions. So be interested to see how we perform here. I mean, technically then it does mean that the NASDAQ could be susceptible to some deeper moves to the downside. I'd probably be then looking at uh, around 10,514, uh, then 10,296, which starts to bring in those previous highs that were seen in June, uh, which also um, comes up to that EU COVID fear low that we saw uh, on the progressive developments that we saw at the um, in Spain uh, and the likes at the end of July. So definitely, I'd say equity is a little bit susceptible here, potentially for some downside. Not so much North American COVID related, but if stimulus is, if there's a lack of stimulus still coming at the moment, uh, if people are just losing a little bit of confidence, let's say on the global level, because UK and Europe COVID situation is worsening, uh, it certainly could be quite interesting uh, to keep an eye on those those levels. And if the trade war starts to, to ratchet up a few notches again, it certainly can act as a bit of a, uh, a catalyst. Um, a few other headlines just to be aware of. Um, this one I don't think is really major, um, but definitely something perhaps to be aware of. Um, this is the ECB is to review its flagship bond buying tool in fighting COVID crisis. Uh, basically debate on the length of the, the PEP program and on transferring its flexibility to other asset purchase schemes. Uh, so this, this could have, I guess, um, more dovish connotations about transferring it to other asset purchase schemes, i.e. Uh, if you think about the asset purchase program, uh, could it be as flexible as this kind of pandemic response PEP um, process? But it's probably too early to say this is just a review stage, but something to just be aware of. It's not really having any meaningful impact this morning. Um, a few other things on the weather front, we continue to see a particularly busy um, hurricane period at the moment and the one we're focusing on here is a new one in the Gulf tropical storm beta and if we actually look at the the details here you can see it's right in quite a key and sensitive area as far as the energy markets are concerned um, so the slow expected uh, the expected slow motion of beta will produce a long duration rainfall event from the middle of Texan coast to southern Louisiana um, there is the danger of life-threatening storm surge near times of high tide through Tuesday along portions of the Texas Louisiana coast within the storm surge warning area. So by the looks of it at the moment, doesn't look quite to the intensity of some of the others that we've had of late, but certainly just um, warrants keeping half an eye on at the moment. And then just quickly looking and, and reviewing the overall calendar for the week, there are a few other things to be aware of. So today is particularly quiet overall. Uh, there really is not a great deal on the docket coming out as per usual really on a Monday. Um, and then as far as weekend headlines were concerned, although I've covered quite a lot, I wouldn't say there was one singular smoking gun that's going to mean the market's going to go in either direction at this point. There's just a lot of more kind of nuanced, sensitive news flow coming out. Uh, but Tuesday then we get uh, Bank of England Bailey uh, speaking at the British Chamber of Commerce webinar. So that'll be the first of his speeches. Um, and then we've got Fed's Chair Powell testifying to the House Financial Services Panel. So this is quite an interesting one. Jerome Powell is going to sit alongside the Treasury Secretary Stephen Mnuchin and they will brief a congressional committee on the effectiveness of policies enacted to combat, combat economic effects of COVID-19. Now markets may look for hints as to whether further fiscal stimulus measures are likely in the near term uh, and if not, then how the Fed might react 
uh, in that type of situation. So definitely that'll be one that warrants watching as well. That's going to be at 3.30 London time uh, when we get round to Tuesday. So again, you've got Bailey and Powell. Interestingly, if you actually look, just a quick glance across the calendar for the week, you've got Feds Evans on Tuesday, Powell on Wednesday, you've got Evans and Rosengrain on Wednesday, Powell then to the House panel uh, on Wednesday as well. Uh, you've got Feds Evans discussing the economy and monetary policy again on Thursday. So there's a lot of Fed speak. Uh, this isn't uncommon. Uh, they have just obviously unveiled a new policy tweak in the form of uh, average inflation targeting. Uh, and so it's, they, they generally like to shoo that in and smooth it over in terms of its markets um, delivery or in, in, uh, interpretation of that new tool. So I wouldn't be looking for too much from them, but it's something to be mindful of. Uh, and I guess that point of, look, if stimulus doesn't come, what are you going to do about it? Uh, is there going to be anything else that you can do to support the economy as far as these politicians will be concerned? Uh, moving on elsewhere, um, Tuesday, the other, other highlights, um, you've got existing home sales coming out of the Fed, Richmond Fed manufacturing. Um, but then moving on to Wednesday, arguably then the most important as far as Europe is concerned, because then we start getting into the key focus, which will be an update on the September confidence readings. You get the flash PMIs. And you've also this week got the German IFO uh, reading. So these will be particularly meaningful when we get to early Wednesday morning trade, manufacturing service PMIs, these are the flash readings, of course, and we also get the same out of the UK uh, and the US later on. Going into Thursday then, you get that German IFO reading, um, and then if we skip further into that afternoon, we then get Bailey's uh, next speech, uh, and then Powell and Mnuchin testifying towards the Senate Banking Committee, so they're really going to be a main feature throughout the week. And then Friday is relatively quiet. The only thing looking out for is durable goods orders. Um, one of the other things I'd say just to be aware of on Tuesday, I know it generates a lot of media attention, but Tesla have their annual shareholder meeting on Tuesday, followed by their battery technology day. So I am absolutely certain that Elon Musk will come out with a new dance move or a new something uh, that will see their shares go through an extreme period, probably of volatility. So it's worth just keeping an eye out for that if you're, if you're monitoring that type of uh, stock. And then finally, on a calendar point of view, uh, for Brexit, uh, gone but not forgotten, I'm afraid. Uh, informal talks between the UK and EU's negotiators will continue uh, this week, but the next formal round of talks is not until next week. Um, the UK government's internal market bill, of course, will remain in the detailed committee early um, next week in terms of getting its approvals. Another vote in the House of Commons lays ahead. However, media reports suggest the PM now has, has done a deal with the rebel MPs, so it should ensure its, its passage at this point in time. Um, and that's it. So, yeah, any questions at all, feel free to, to just drop me a line in the comments section. Obviously, always happy to help. Um, more videos coming, of course. Uh, tomorrow so I'll see you then. Good luck for today and this week. All the best.